Let me first of all thank every one of you for coming out on this evening. It's nasty out. <laughs> no other way to say it. It's March 31st and the sun should be shining and you should have a glorious uh, beach day. But uh, somehow there's a disruption going on and there's snow. So we'll, we'll see what the Lord is doing here. And I thank you all for being here. I want to share with you that I have some friends here from Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary and I'm going to ask them to bring some materials here for you. Um, I know that many of your uh, directors, John and Teal and some other folks here are Gordon Conwell alums. I'm a Gordon Conwell alum, the two admissions rep, uh, Kenneth Hill, I want you to raise your hand, Kenneth, right, and Tiffany Miller, Williams there, raise your hand, and uh, they are here to share with you uh, some of the great things that we're doing at Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. So if you have an inkling, just an inkling that after, uh, after conquering Harvard, that you are interested in uh, seminary, <laughs> I guess I should speak up loud. <laughs> then uh, we would love to talk to you about uh, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. Um, I think it's a phenomenal place. I'm going to share from, from a passage in the Gospel according to Mark. Um, wonderfully set up by the worship team. We certainly thank the worship team for leading us and setting the ambiance. Uh, phenomenal job. Really appreciate uh, what you all have done. There's a passage in Mark chapter 6, uh, verses 30 to 32. And the Gospel of Mark is an interesting gospel because it was the first one written, and it's the shortest one. It only has 16 chapters. It begins with essentially Jesus being baptized, and it ends with the ascension of Christ. And there are this lot of speculation around where does the Gospel of Mark actually end. So in many Bibles, there's a short ending, and then it says an extended ending in that 16th chapter. But there's something phenomenal that happens in that sixth chapter that I want to pay a little attention to. Uh, before we get there, in chapter 1, verse 30, we find that Jesus is teaching, and he's preaching, and he's healing. Even before he calls the 12 disciples, he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's healing. And then along the way, he calls some disciples, some of them are fishermen, some of them tax collectors, some of them unknown vocation, and he calls them, but he continues to teach and to preach and to heal. In the fifth chapter, we know that he is somewhere, probably in Capernaum, and uh, some woman comes behind him and touches him, and he asks, who was it that touched me? And the Bible says that the woman was trembling, and she kind of admitted that it was her, but just as he was about to engage with her, there was news from Jairus' house that his daughter was dead. Anybody remember this, this area? And so the news comes and the messenger shouting, your daughter is dead. An absolute disruption. And Jairus, an anointed one, a leader, is with uh, Jesus and Jesus leans over saying, it's, 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 it's all right, it's all right. And they make way to Jairus' home, and, and Jesus walks in with Jairus, and he says to, to him that your daughter is not dead, she's just sleeping. And when he does that, all the people around who were crying start heckling him and say that this dude is whack. <laughs> I mean, this dude is nuts. He's bonkers. She's dead. We, we're here. We see her. She's dead. Jesus is probably the coolest dude that has ever walked the planet. Jesus had mad swag. Because Jesus basically says, get up. And the girl got up. And then we find that there are a number of incidents there. We find about the death of John the Baptist. But then we get to chapter 6, verse 30, 32. It's right before... Jesus and the disciples feed the 5,000. And most people who look at this passage jump to him feeding the 5,000. A phenomenal, miraculous event. I mean, it just a, a, I mean, 
wonders and signs galore, the but there's something that happens before that. Mark chapter 6, verse 30 and 32. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and talked. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Jesus had commissioned them two by two to go out and heal and do all kinds of stuff, and they came back. And they were so busy that they didn't even have time to eat. Anybody in here so busy studying that you don't have time to eat sometimes? I mean, can we be real about it? I mean, and, and, and even if you do have time to eat, you like eat the wrong stuff. <laughs> and see, yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, you, when you stay on the planet just a little bit longer, see y'all, some of y'all bodies can deal with it now. <laughs> now you hear where I'm going. You, the longer you stay on the planet, the longer your body will speak back to you. <laughs> it will tell you, don't feed me that I told you the last time. So they were so busy, so busy working, that they didn't even have time to eat. So Jesus says, let's pause for the cause. And I want to share with you that every now and then we need to pause for the cause. Sometimes we need to unplug and unwind and just pause for the cause. In music, and we've had some phenomenal musicians up here. In music, we have this uh, nomenclature, this, this thing called a fermata, right? And the fermata essentially means that you hold the note, use it for extra count. And sometimes you have a rest with a fermata over. And it means that instead of giving it a regular pulse, the regular B, you, you just extend it just a little while longer. It's one of those things like in the in the Psalms when we hear, see that word Selah, S-E-L-A-H. <coughs> now, I, I'm from Los Angeles and I, I have a little bit of vernacular. I, I, I got a PhD and multiple masters and I've been a professor for many years. But yeah, as they say, you can take the guy out of Los Angeles, but you can't take the Los Angeles out of him. <laughs> and so I translate Selah as let it marinate. <laughs> so, so when you're reading in the Psalms and you have that passage, you know, six or seven lines, and then over to the right side it says Selah. Just think of me when you read that. Yo, let that marinate for a second, right? Because we, we get busy reading and we just want to get, get through reading it and, and try not to mispronounce any words, right? And we kind of run past the Selahs, right? And you want to let that marinate. Look what, what the Word of God says right there. Let it sink in and soak in. And in many ways, Jesus is telling disciples, y'all need to let what just happened marinate for a second. Let, just absorb what just, just, just happened. It's, it's almost like, for anyone with a Mac, when you have a Mac and like your computer is like moving faster than the processor is going, and you get that little beach ball that spins, <laughs> right? And it's almost like your computer is saying, hey, you're going too fast, right? We only have X amount of, you know, and you got all the nomenclature for the gigabyte and wigabytes and trigabytes and all of this stuff. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean. but, but, but it's almost like, you know, just chill for a second, right? Just pop. It's almost like when you're trying to watch Netflix, and you get to the really good part of whatever you're watching, and the screen freezes? <laughs> I mean, anybody been there? It, it, it's almost like, hey, I, you know, you're really into it. You're like, <gasps> right? And then it's just like, right? And it's one of those things that just says, pause for a second. Just let it marinate. I mean, old school media devices always had this thing with two lines on it called a pause button. <laughs> I don't think we had those things anymore. I mean, you, you can go, I mean, let me see how far we can go back. Yeah, old CD players. Y'all remember those? Yeah. 
and, and you can be, they will be spinning on there, and your music will be listening, and you push the thing with the two little dots, like the, you know, exclamation, I mean, not the, the uh, quote mark, and you push it, and it will just stop. It freeze, right? Anybody remember the cassette player? Yeah. Yeah. All right, I'm just checking you. Just checking. Just checking. You, you can have that cassette thing, the two little things running like this, right? And you push the pause. Now you had to push, put a little energy in it and push it like this. <laughs> you couldn't just tap it. Y'all remember that? But, but it would pause, right? It would pause. The old school turntables. Anybody remember the old school record player turntable? See, because when you had the lever and you lift it up and moved it over, that there was a little thing over here that you could just lift up. And it would make the arm go like this. The record would still be spinning, but the arm, just to pause for a second, right? Now, clearly y'all don't remember the VHS machine. Y'all look at the VHS? Okay, all right. All right. So you had the VHS, right? And it's moving. You can push the pause. And I think that God has wired us to understand that every now and then, we need to pause for the cause. Let, let, me, let, me, let me show you something here because Jesus told the disciples, we're going to go to a desolate or a deserted or a solitary place so that we can just re-energize. And, and the re-energizing re is important because we all need to rest. Our bodies need to rest. Never forget, uh, you don't mind me sharing. I, I was probably 2008, 2009, I was professor of music at Northeastern University, chair of the African American Studies Department, uh, rising up, doing phenomenal stuff, traveling all over the world, lecturing and talking and preaching and doing great things. And I remember one day at home, it was a Saturday morning. It was a Saturday morning. And I woke up and I couldn't move. I couldn't move. I, I, I was just paralyzed in my bed. And, and it, it was probably the most scariest thing in my life. My oldest son was five years old. My youngest son was three years old. And my wife had gone in the kitchen. She was making breakfast. And I woke up and I was paralyzed. I just could not move. And I remember having to try to, to scream. And, and it was one of those weird screams because you didn't want to shock and, and scare the kids. But I needed to get my wife's attention. And I couldn't move. And I, I, I mustered up all the energy to try to try to scream. And, and so I made this little weird sound. And it was absolutely not characteristic. So my wife comes running into the bedroom. And I said, babe, I, 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 I can't move. I can't move. And so now she's panicked and frightened. So she tries to push me over so I can kind of lean off the bed. And, 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 and so finally get me standing up, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't move, I couldn't move. And so we kind of mosey along and try to get me in the van. We go to the ER, and, and, and I mean, this is just petrifying, scary. So we get into the ER, and they hook me up with the IV, trying to figure out what, what's going on. All the metrics were right. Nothing was, no heart attack, no stroke. I just couldn't move. And the doctor came back and talked about both being exhausted and dehydrated. Now, if you've ever played sports, what's the one thing your coach always tells you to do? Always stay hydrated. And here I was so busy being so important that I didn't realize that I had not hydrated not drink anything. And my body is essence shut down. Jesus tells the disciples to pause for the cause. Why? Because they're out doing ministry, they're out saving lives, they're out sharing the gospel, they're out discipling folks, they're out teaching people, preaching, that they're, they're healing people, but they're so busy doing that they're not being. And so God says you need to pause just to re-energize, rest your body. Then there's a notion of rejuvenating. I don't know how many of us spend time meditating. 
a little different than praying, just, just meditating, being, being. If you do yoga and you, you find time to stretch, or for some of us, uh, we, we jog. My favorite thing is to swim laps. Because I spent the majority of my life being afraid of water. I, 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 at the age of 11, I was out with my cousin in the Pacific Ocean, and I slipped on the undertow and I drowned. And when I came to, somebody pushed me on my chest like this. And from that time to probably almost a decade ago, I was definitely afraid of water. I, I wouldn't take a bath. Shower only. And I happened to be teaching in the island of St. Croix, 15 students from Northeastern. And we were going snorkeling. And I was just going to stay on the boat by myself and just chill. I, I had learned how to miss all the fun because that water is too high. I don't care how warm it is. I don't care how blue it is. I don't care what's under it. I'm good. <laughs> and you know, we had some of the guys who were with us, and they always try to throw people in. And I'm like, yeah, you don't want to mess with this one. <laughs> I know I'm the professor. But in those three minutes that it's going to take me to take care of y'all, I won't be the professor. <laughs> right? And I, I remember the, the students going off and, and going in the water and snorkeling and coming back and having a great time and talking about all the things that they saw. Some of them had digital cameras and showed me pictures of the Barracuda and, and the, you know, and all kind of phenomenal stuff. And I was like, oh, that's cool, that's cool, but I ain't going. <laughs> Not the kid, right? And we were out in the town one day and a Rastafarian brother had heard that I, we were there and heard that I was a minister and said, hey, Mark, he said, you love God, eh? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, don't you know that 70% of God's creation is underwater, boy? <laughs> Whoa. So when I got back home, went to the YMCA, learned how to swim. And he was right. There's nothing like seeing the rest of God's creation in the water. You look at the mass volumes of, of things, creation of the water. And, and the thing about it was, for me, I was missing all of that because of my fear. And even now when I get into the water, I, you know, it takes me a little longer than everybody else to get into the pool. You know, some folks just jump in. Me, I got to go the steps. And I got to go step by step. Y'all know, because when the water gets up to here, I just got to get my little chill thing on, and I'm OK. I'm all right. Right? A little post-traumatic stress in the water. So I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. But the reality is that we have to find ways to rejuvenate, to, 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 to spend that time with God. And for me, because it's an ongoing fear thing of conquering that fear, I have to rely on God when I get in that water. So now I love to swim laps because it's my time with God. It seems like the boringest thing and when I wasn't swimming. I was like, man, people who swim laps are weird. Because <laughs> you're not looking at anything. It's like, it's like the bottom of the pool. It's like, what are you, right? But I'm swimming. I'm singing to myself. I'm talking to the Lord. Living to the Lord, talk back. Every now and then you hear some bubbles. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a good time. But you've got to program in time to, to re-energize. But then there's another piece. But you have to focus on reconnecting. And reconnecting is prayer. I talk about prayer like a transistor radio. You guys know what transistor radio is? Them old things when you used to go to places, I think Radio Shack still exists. Remember Radio Shack? No. Okay, I'm really old. I apologize for that. That's why my hair is gone. Um, a transistor radio is almost like an electronic gizmo that runs by a battery. It has a battery, a couple of wires, and there's a magnet in there. And essentially what happens with the antenna and the magnet, if you turn the knob the right way, it'll go from all being fuzzed to being able to ch chime in on a radio frequency. And the transistor radio when we were kids was so fun because we thought that we could hear Mars. And so we would try to tune in and see if we could hear Martian talking. I mean, you know, kid stuff. And it's, yeah, forgive me. Uh, but we, we did that. But the reality is prayer is like that. 
Because God is always talking with you, talking to you, but we have to calm our minds down and try to find the right frequency. Because when we find the right frequency, God is saying, hey, welcome back. Been here all the time. So glad to talk to you again. But then the reconnection part is that sometimes we want to talk at God and then say, amen, I'm done. <laughs> God, you don't know what has happened to me today. But amen, bye. <laughs> 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 and, and, and prayer should be a dialogue, right? A dialogue is an exchange of words, transmission of words. So you get your peace in and then you pause and listen. And we forget that. God, you said you was going, and then, amen. <laughs> right? And the notion of just pausing and letting God speak back, it's like, baby, it's okay. I got you. Right? Or, when you get to class tomorrow, don't sit in front because this is what's going to happen. Right? I, mean, I think God can actually talk to you in that way if we listen. That's why we got to reconnect. I believe that Jesus took the disciples off to the side so that they can re-energize and rejuvenate and so they can reconnect with God. Because the reality is that they were physically, emotionally, spiritually, and mentally tired. And I think some of us are too. Now we may not have an ability to have a vacation or a staycation. Some of us take digital vacations like unplug from Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram, at least for three hours. Can we do that? <laughs> All right. Actually, you guys have been good because I don't see anybody. It, I mean, you know, and I'm kind of offended because I think that what I say is actually tweetable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the point is that sometimes you need to unplug from your regular route and spend some time either with yourself, with loved ones, or with God. And I think that's what Jesus was doing. Because they were headed towards another long phase of ministry where they're feeding 5,000 people. Y'all remember when that happened, right? Because what, what happened was this. Jesus said, let's go over there. They got in the boat and went to a deserted island. Guess what? The people followed them. <laughs> and so they really didn't get that much time to rest. And when the people followed them, guess what? The people were not in their regular habitat. So Jesus says, we got all these people here. We need to feed them. And the disciples were like, uh-uh. We didn't ask them to come. We don't know who they are. Jesus, we ain't got that much money. We don't even know what they like to eat. <laughs> Jesus was like, go see what we have access to. And you know the disciples all sucking their tongue and rolling their eyes and doing all this stuff. And Jesus was like, go. I mean, this is Jesus. Jesus had mad swag. I mean, because I mean, who else is gonna tell twelve dudes what to do when they tired? They hung. They hungry too, right? They exhausted. They went, and so Jesus took care of everybody. And so part of the challenge is that you can do phenomenal feats when you pause for the cause. You can nail those finals. <clears throat> you can take care of those interest exams. You can figure out all of the things that you need to figure out. You can figure out your next steps in life if you pause and spend some time re-energizing, rejuvenating. One of the biggest challenges in my life has been saying no to certain jobs saying no to certain jobs. I mean, can you hear me? It's like, who says no to jobs? Right? And very lucrative jobs. But it was only because I had spent time with the Lord. I have a philosophy now that I try my very best to not make decisions without praying. Even when emails come in and I get invited to do stuff, that I pause and pray. No matter how cool it sounds, no matter how good it looks, because sometimes things are obstacles. And sometimes things take you away from what the Lord has for you. And they're usually good things that entice you. And so we have to learn how to pause for the cause. How to really assess and figure out what God is doing in our lives. 
Because the fact is that God has something particularly special and powerful for each and every one of you to do. And that's why you pause to figure out what God is doing in your life. To reflect on how God's hand is on you. To sense what God is saying to you. To get a sense of God's timing and the pulse and the activity and the direction. To know that God is able to do abundantly and exceedingly more than you could ever imagine if you trust God. But you have to trust him in real time. Because every now and then God calls audibles. You can't deal with today's situation with yesterday's prayer. <coughs> Because God may have given you a directive yesterday for yesterday, but that not, may not necessarily be for today. And so you've got to focus on what's going on in real time. All of you have made it this far in your life because God's hand is on you, whether you know it or not. So the more that you know it, the more that you want to acknowledge it, appreciate it, love God for it, but also listen and feel. Because God will do miraculous things for you. I know. That's part of his promises. That God will never leave you. God will never forsake you. And yes, you will struggle. You will suffer. You will go through some things. But those things are to teach you that when it's time to celebrate, you better celebrate. You need to learn how to pat yourself on the back for the small things. So that when the large things come, you already have a built-in lifestyle to celebrate. Because when those dark days come, you're going to need to remember the light days to help pull you out and pull you through. As I close, I want to share this. As I shared with a number of you in the smaller session before, that Psalm 23 is a powerful testimony for me. I know it's the great funeral passage, and I don't see it as a funeral passage. I, I, I should think it's misplaced as a funeral passage. Because Psalm 23 says, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death. It don't say to. <laughs> <laughs> it says through. So it ain't no death passage for me. Right? But the other piece, the other operative thing about the through is that that valley of the shadow of death is a season. And seasons have beginnings and endings. And so the goal is always to keep walking, keep moving. Sometimes you got a good stride where you got a three foot pace. Sometimes you got a medium stride where you got a one foot pace. Sometimes you got that kind of small stride where you like by the, by the size of your big toe, your, your big toe right? But as long as you keep stepping and keep moving, you can get through. But those situations are not to be stagnant in. Don't stand in the valley of the shadow. Who would stand in the valley of the shadow? <laughs> You'd be amazed how many people like stand there and want to look around and be like, oh, I didn't know you were going to be here. <laughs> I'm trying to roll through that bad boy. You know I'm out. Right? The moment I know where I am, I'm trying to get out of there, right? So keep moving, right? God gave you two eyes in the front of your head, not the back of your head, so that you're always looking forward, right? And then God gave you two ears and one mouth, right? This is for my children here. This is for my, I'm having a flashback to yesterday. <laughs> Let me tell you what I told them because it may work for you. you. You're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak. When you listen twice as much as you speak, you'll be amazed at how much information and data you take in. Sometimes the people who talk the most are not the wisest. They're just the ones who suck up all the air in the room. But if you listen twice as much as you speak, you'll actually have more power, more impact, and more influence. Okay? But don't forget that valley and the shadow of death. It's not a destination. You're going through it. And so forth, in those dark moments that you have, in those dark moments that you have had, those dark moments that you will have, keep walking. Keep moving. Keep your stride. Because that had a beginning, and it will have an end. 
and that end is not your end. Amen? amen. All right, amen. God bless you. Word in your hands, y'all know what to do with it. Now let's do the cue. Y'all gonna go and get shy on me now. <laughs> Act like we don't know each other. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, uh, thanks for that sermon. That was, you know. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask a question about your academic work, actually. Yeah. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about um, the, the work that you've done to study the intersection between religion and hip hop? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I appreciate the question. I'm going to take, take it back further than that. I was, I was telling some of the folks in the other room that uh, when I was in high school, I had a, a calculus AB. I took AP, Calc AB, uh, teacher who, uh, who essentially told me that I would never get this calculus thing. And uh, I found out that he went to UCLA. I'm from Los Angeles, I'm from California, Los Angeles. And I figured I found out that he went to UCLA. So I actually had my heart set on going to Cal Berkeley, uh, which is a competing school in California. And I was going to major in mathematics. And, and this is a true story. And I was going to get my degree and go back down to the high school and put the degree on his desk and flip in the bird and then go on with my life. <laughs> it's a true story. That's how I actually picked my major in college. The true story. Absolutely true story. And, and, and it didn't help that in Los Angeles at the time, they were giving $10,000 stipends for any uh, males of color who would go into the STEM fields. And so the impetus was that teacher and this $10,000 check that I was going to buy me a crib with. <laughs> I was really naive. That's Los Angeles now. You can't buy a crib for $10,000. <laughs> no matter how old I am, right? And so I went to Cal Berkeley and majored in, in pure math. Um, in my sophomore year, I had a, a, a professor named Ollie Wilson. Professor Ollie Wilson changed my life and saw in me that I had uh, this really sense of inquiry in music. Uh, I had been a musician since the age four, started playing professionally at age 11 at my church and other churches, and was doing dinner parties in the Hollywood Hills for a number of movie stars. And, you know, I was a little black boy on the piano when they had dinner parties and superstars and there was a tip jar on top of the piano and I learned that when some of these folks got intoxicated <laughs> that they wanted to sing and they often want to sing like these kind of weird songs like Dean Martin and you know Frank Sinatra. <laughs> only reason I call them, only reason I call them weird is because like they didn't want to sing the right way they wanted to sing like the intoxicated way <laughs> and so I, I, I figured out that if I could back them up while they were singing, no matter how bad it was, that the tip jar, you would go from like $10 bills to $20 bills to $50 bills to $100 bills. And so I went home and I learned how to play, I'll do it my way, in all the 12 keys and in every way. <laughs> You're talking money. That's one of my lingua francas, right? <laughs> and so I was able to do that, but I went to Cal Berkeley and I studied uh, uh, math and Ollie Wilson, uh, Dr. Ollie Wilson, uh, showed me that there was something in music that I can study, history of music, the history of music. And so I double majored and finished uh, four years with the music degree and uh, had a couple years left with the math degree and went on and did a master's and PhD in ethnomusicology, which is study the relationship between music and culture. And so here, uh, as one who at age 11 been playing in churches, and by the time I graduated from college, I probably played in probably 30 to 40 different denominations. And I learned the liturgies and the litanies of various denominations. And I learned that, that although it seems like we're worshiping God in different ways, that there are some core aspects that are very similar. Because even if you go to a hymnal and you look at a certain hymn, and you go to the Presbyterian hymnal, the Episcopal hymnal, the Baptist hymnal, and you can keep going, that they'll change certain words to align with their theology, but the hymn is still the same. And so I learned how to do all that. So when I got to college, I was studying John Coltrane, 
and, and, and I was studying John Coltrane's concept of spirituality. Because if you like Coltrane, 1964, he had one of his most important albums, Love Supreme. And if you read the liner notes to the album, it's actually this theological truths. It was very Trinitarian, and it had his notion of who God was in his life at that time. So I studied that and had this kind of connectivity, but I also grew up in Los Angeles. And I remember when hip hop came to Los Angeles. And I remember the impact that it had because as young people who grew up in the inner city, we didn't really have a voice. But hip hop became our voice. All right, so when you heard, don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge, I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> Sometimes I'm wondering how I keep it going on. Right? And you hear that, and it's like, yo, that's how I feel. Right? Or, right, here's a, here's a, I am a nightmare walking, psychopath talking, king of the jungle, just a gangster walking, living life like a firecracker, short as my feet. Right? It's a soundtrack from Colors, Ice T. Right? The old iced tea, gangbanger iced tea, not America's favorite cop iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> I told y'all I was old. Right? And so these rhymes like, were like our, right? And there are some that I can't quote right now because I've given my life to Jesus now. <laughs> <laughs> I still listen to them, I just don't say them. <laughs> but something like if you watch the movie Straight, Straight Out of Compton, NWA. They had a song called F the Police, right? Now, I'm a pastor now, and I have police in my congregation, and I love police. I didn't always love police. I grew up in a place where police were crooked. The Los Angeles Police Department had the most corrupt police department in the country under Chief Darrell Gates back in the, in the 80s. And so I, I, I have PTSD from that. I love police now. But the thing about that song was in the hood where I grew up, it was almost like an anthem because the police were doing some corrupt stuff. But then when I went to the valley in the suburbs where all the young